church, if you would stand with me. As we read the word of the Lord, we'll be in Exodus chapter 4 uh, this morning. Exodus chapter 4, I'm reading from the New uh, Revised Standard Version. Um, it's up on the screen as well, so you can follow along as I read out loud. Uh, the word of the Lord says this. It says, Then Moses answered, But suppose they, they don't believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he, God, said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake, and Moses drew back from him. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it and became a staff in his hand, so that they might believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Father, we thank you for the ways that you stretch us beyond what we consider our capacity and our ability. Uh, Lord, thank you that past experiences don't define the ways that you desire to, to use us and to work through our lives. Uh, Father, thank you particularly for this account called Exodus that, that, that teaches us that your eyes are upon the lowly, your eyes are upon the oppressed, your eyes are upon the captive. Um, your eyes are upon the insecure, the unable. Your eyes are upon the weak and the ones that don't have charisma or eloquency. Um, you see us, and it is through your strength, Lord, that anything of significance happens in our lives. So we thank you for that. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Feel free to have a seat. A little bit of seri series reintroduction for you. Last week we started a, a sermon series, a summer sermon series called The Questioning God. And what you find very quickly as you read through uh, the, the scriptures is that you will find that God regularly asks questions of humanity. And it isn't because God needs answers. It isn't that God, the all-knowing God, needs more information um, but often he asks questions because he knows our hearts and he knows us better than we know ourselves. And so by asking these questions, so often what God is doing is that he is drawing out from the depths of our hearts, our perspectives, our mindsets, our experiences, our insecurities, all the, the doubts and the places of frustration and anger that reside deep with, within us that we might be unaware of. And he brings it to the surface by asking these probing type questions. And the other thing that happens as he asks these questions of us is I believe that he teaches us what it is to pray. That it isn't simply, prayer isn't simply coming before God and saying, here are the things that I want in life, right? But we recognize prayer is so often this conversational relationship with God where he, we recognize he hears us, but we also hear him. And so often in prayer, it's this habit of learning to slow down, to be still and to be silent so that we might be more and more aware of what God has been saying and what he has already been up to in the world around us, and that we might join him in what he's doing around us. Today we're going to, as you know, we're in Exodus chapter 4 here in the story of Moses, but I want to start with fire. Um, I love fire. I, I, maybe it's a guy thing, but if you've ever been at a bonfire or a backyard uh, there's, uh, if there's ever a fire pit there, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is to immediately think, what might be in my surroundings that I can throw into the fire just to watch how it burns? Anyone else have that? Just a little appetite. Just say, I just want to know what it would look like to see that thing burn. It, it, and, okay, so there might be other people in the room that just think, that's weird and I've never had that thought before in my life. Is there, there's other people in that room. Maybe there's two types of people in the world. This, just this last month, month of June, um, school ended and 
as a family, we just did a little backyard barbecue, and we have a, a fire uh, pit that we have in our backyard. And I set it up so that way we can have, you know, sit in the backyard, have hamburgers and watermelon, and then afterwards we were going to do s'mores uh, with the boys. And as I got the fire pit ready, um, my boy's eyes got really big, and, and then I asked permission if I could share this. And, and so my oldest boy, Justice, he, his eyes got big, he ran inside to the house, and he came back outside with all of the school paperwork that he's done over this past year. <laughs> and over the next 45 minutes to an hour and a half, him and his younger brother were just crumbling up homework and throwing it in the fire. Summer officially began. We just wanted to watch how it burned. And once they ran out of paper, they looked around to see if there were just dried up sticks and leaves that they can continue to throw in the fire. It is, Moses is, on, is, is one of us in that first group of people that just want to see how things burn. And the reason I say that is though we read in Exodus chapter 4 this interaction between God and, and Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, what you find is, is that while Moses is shepherding a flock of sheep, he's enthralled by a bush. And it's, in, it's interesting that we've, we've come to call this story the story of the burning bush because the, the, the very purpose of this story is the fact that the bush was not burning. But it was engulfed in fire, but it was not consumed. And it was such a sight that Moses had to just stop everything. He stopped in his tracks, and he, he continued to go up that mountain to figure out what in the world is going on here. This past week, I listened um, to, she's the associate professor of Old Testament theology at Biola University, Dr. Carmen Imes. And she made this connection that I have never been aware of before. And she said it was actually a, a new revelation that she had as she interacted um, with more of the Eastern Orthodoxy expressions of Christianity. And she said that historically, the church has seen the burning bush and has made a connection with the Virgin Mary. And actually, you'll see all over, and I'll bring one of the art pictures up on the screen, um, you'll see that you'll, you'll, in Eastern Orthodox traditions and across church history, there are regularly these depictions of Mary being like the burning bush. And the connection that was made in this reflection by Dr. Carmen Imes was that, that Mary, like this bush, is completely engulfed, enveloped in the presence of the Lord. And the mystery for the church is how do you get that close to the presence of God and not be consumed? That the mystery of it, right? Because maybe, maybe right now you're, you're, the gears are turning in your mind as you think through the pages of, of the Hebrew scriptures is that if anyone gets close to the presence of God, they immediately cry out with words like, woe is me. And the understanding is to be that close to, be, to God's presence was to mean death. It means that that was a place of, of fear and trepidation. How can you get that close to the presence of God? And so Mary now is this new chapter in human history where, where the spirit of God can come upon fully upon an individual. And then, and then the, the thought continued by Dr. Carmen Imes is, is that actually people have looked over this story in the book of Exodus and they have realized that what God is communicating is that Moses and Israel will be like this burning bush. That they will be enveloped in the presence of God. And after God delivers his people out of bondage and out of their slavery in Egypt, 
you're going to read over and over again about how God dwells in the camp of Israel. That he will be their God and he will be their people. And so there's kind of three ways that I'll, that I'll reflect on this for a moment, and then we'll go to that question that God asks of Moses, right? When we think about this, there, there's this communication that's happening from God to Moses as he looks at this burning bush, in that the presence of God will come upon Moses, and he will, and, and here's a demonstration of God's power, here's a demonstration of God's protection, and here's a demonstration of God's presence. Here's what I, what I mean by that, just going a little bit further on this is Moses is stopped in his track because, because there is a power on display that Moses cannot comprehend. There is something taking place here in this scene, and, and what, what God is communicating here, right, is, is listen. Just like m- me and my boys crumpling up pieces of paper or grabbing sticks and throwing it into the fire, the reason that we do this is because we know fire needs fuel. That in order for a fire to keep on going, it needs to consume. It needs whatever that, you know, the wood that is there or whatever it might be uh, burning up. But for this bush to not be consumed, God is communicating, I'm self-sufficient. I don't need anything else to be sustained. I don't need anything else to keep on going. And there's, there's, there's a powerful display of the characteristics of God here as this bush is not burned up. God alone is almighty. God alone is self-sufficient. He doesn't need whatever we think we might need to bring to the table for, for, for his work to be accomplished. He alone is all-powerful. The other thing that's being communicated here in this is, is the Lord's protection. The bush is safe here in this fire. It's not being consumed. And, and what I want you to just simply hear in, is this. In his use of the bush, God does not need to destroy or exhaust the bush. And in God's dealing with us, when he works through our lives, he doesn't need to exhaust us or consume us. As a lot of times, it's the exact opposite. He is the one that sustains and refreshes and restores us. And the other thing that I want you to hear about this is his presence. Is that this bush is enveloped in the presence of the Lord. And the staggering, mind-blowing invitation to Israel is that God will make his home amongst them. And what's the imagery that God uses once he leads people out of Egypt and into the wilderness? They will be led by a pillar of fire. God is making a statement here, I will dwell amongst you. He, he will all, his, his presence will always burn bright amongst the people of Israel. So let's go back. Let's go back to, or I guess forward, back to Exodus chapter 4. Uh, Moses stands before the Lord in Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4, all the way until about Exodus chapter 7. There are eight interactions that God has with Moses. Moses constantly, over those eight interactions, Moses is essentially asking, who am I that you're sending me? I'm, I, I don't have eloquence of speech. I, like, over eight times, Moses voices this insecurity, this, this self-doubt, like there's no way that I'm the guy that you're choosing to go to Pharaoh, to stand before him, to, to deliver your people Israel. And God, over those eight times, is, is reminding Moses, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you. And in one of those interactions that I want to highlight here is, is Moses asks, well, what if the people of Israel don't believe that you actually appeared to me? What if the people of Israel don't listen to me? And, Mo, and, and God asks a question to him. He asks this question, Moses, what's in your hand? 
Moses is filled with doubt. Moses is, is filled with anxiousness. Moses is filled with this place of just saying, like, I, I, don't, I don't understand how you're calling me. And rather than giving an answer, God asks a question to him. Moses, what are you holding? What are you holding? Let's talk about that first one, power. Moses, what do you possess? A staff? I can use that. I can use that. You're a shepherd. You know what it is to, to lead a flock of sheep. Moses, I don't need much. I can use your vocation. I can use the little bit that you're bringing to the table here. The God of five loaves and two fishes speaks to Moses and just ask, simply asks, what do you, what do you possess? Because my power infused with whatever is in your hand, that's what'll make the difference here. Exodus chapter three starts with these words. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. Moses led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And it's like here in this moment, what God is doing by telling Moses, what's in your hand, is just immediately reminding Moses, Moses, look, you already faithfully led a flock of sheep up to this mountain. And I'm going to use you in that same way to lead people now. And it's this way that, that God speaks to Moses of just by simply asking what's in your hand is saying that I'm going to come alongside what you have already been doing because I have already been working in your life. Look in your hand. I've been already faithfully using you to care for these sheep. I've been already faithfully using you to do a good work. And now I'm just going to use you in a new way. And I'm going to use the little bit that you have to offer. This past uh, week, Lewis and I were chatting about the, the Sabbath just because she came across this reflection um, that I, it was through a, maybe a podcast or through a book that she was reading. And, and the conversation that we were having was that, that for the people of Israel, that the Sabbath day, and actually the day, it, it just days in general, begin at sundown. But in our culture, we think that the day starts when we wake up, right? When we wake up, we say it's the start of a new day. And as she was chatting and, 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 and reflecting on what she had been listening to, she said there's this subtle difference that takes place in your mind when you think about when the day starts and when the day ends. Because in our mind, we think that, that the day starts when we wake up and we begin working. And we finish our work, and that's when the day ends, and we go to sleep, and then we commit to the Lord all the things that we've been doing and accomplishing and saying, okay, God, now things are in your hands as I lay myself down to sleep. But if the day starts when the sun is setting, then it's a completely different mindset. What it means is the day begins with the Lord's work. The day begins when he's at work and we're sleeping. And so when, when we wake up in the morning, the day has already been happening. And when we wake up, we join the Lord in the work that he's already been up to. Completely different approach to things. And so by looking at the staff in his hand, it's this reminder to Moses, listen, I have already been using you. I have already been at work in your lives. I have already been shaping and molding you as a shepherd. What's in your hand? Now you're just going to use 
that tool in a way that's going to come alongside what I'm already doing in this world. Let's talk about that next one, protection. Moses comes and asks the Lord, what if, what if they don't, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And I think what's behind this question that Moses is asking is, is listen, God, they're going to need to trust me. You're wanting to m me to lead these thousands of people. They're going to need to know that they're okay under my leadership. They're, they're going to actually have to step into this new world of, of courage and and confrontation. And they're going to look at me and they're going to say, like, you're going to be the one that's going to be able to keep us safe. You're going to be able to be the one that keeps us protected. And I think by asking what's in your hand, the Lord is communicating to a shepherd's heart. Look at the staff. God's ring, I'm a shepherd at heart. And I have your safety in mind. A curious command is given here in this moment from God to Moses. He asks, what's in your hand? Moses responds, a staff. And then God says, throw it on the ground. And so Moses takes that staff and he throws it on the ground. And I'll, listen, can I stop for a moment? I... I hate creepy, crawly, slithering, scurrying creatures. I like snails, lizards, slugs, mice, snakes. I'm not down with it. It's just not, it's just not what I enjoy. It's not like, like if, if, there's a cockroach in the house. I'm calling Larissa, right? Like, can you, can, can you deal with it? My boys know this. They love creepy, crawly, slimy, slithering, scurrying things. And they torture me. Like, not exaggerating. They will pick up a snail, and they will chase me. <laughs> and yes, have the picture of your, in your mind of a six, seven-year-old chasing around a 40-year-old in the backyard as they're holding a snail shell, just like, I don't want anything to do with it. And they go in our backyard, and they find lizards, and they hold them, and they, like, pretend to throw them at me, like, catch, Dad. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you get no ice cream today. All, all that to say, listen, I, Moses draws back, right? He, he throws the staff on the ground, and it explicitly tells us within the pages of Scripture. Moses throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake, and, and Moses steps back. Like, just good man, right? Smart move. There's a snake on the ground. But then this is what God says. He doesn't, now listen, listen, listen. If God came to me and he said, I'm going to do a once-in-a-lifetime moment in human history where I'm going to deliver a, a sl enslaved people out of the hands of the mightiest nation that the world has ever known up to this point in history, and in order, I'm going to call you to, be a, to participate in this, and in order for you to trust me, like, I'm going to have you pick up a snake. In that moment, I'm like, this is the way that you want to show me that you're going to use me to do this once-in-a-lifetime moment. Like, if God was speaking to that moment, I would find the courage to pick up the snake. But I would pick it up right behind its head. I would not grab the tail by the, by the snake by the end of its tail where it can still strike me. But that's God's instruction to Moses. Seize it by its tail. 
why does God ask that? Or why does God give that command? I'm going to protect you. I need you to trust me. You're going to be protected. You're safe. You are safe with me. Actually, one of the reflections that people have when they look over the story of the burning bush is that in Exodus chapter 2, one of the very last verses of Exodus chapter 2, it says this. It says, the Israelites groaned under their slavery and they cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and took notice of them. That's, Exodus, that's the end of Exodus chapter 2. Then there's the story of the burning bush right there at the front end of Exodus chapter 3. Right after that story, listen to what Scripture says in, chapter, in verse 7 of chapter 3. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And then in verse 9, God reiterates, the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians have oppressed them. Surrounding the story of the burning bush, three times God says, I have heard the cry of my people under the oppression of Egypt. And as biblical scholars and Bible nerds have looked at this, what they have realized is that the story of the burning bush is this declaration to the people of Israel, you will be under the fire of Egypt, but God will protect you. You right now are in this place of the fiery furnace. God has heard your cry, and he will free you. God is speaking to a shepherd's heart and teaching him. I hear the cries of my people, and I will be their deliverer. Not only that, but over the story of the book of Exodus, God's incredible power is going to be thrown at Egypt. And as all of these plagues are happening on Egypt, Israel still, in, they're, they're in the land as those plagues are happening but they're protected. And God is communicating here, like, listen, I will keep my people safe in my hand. You're safe with me. And then let's talk about presence. There are, there are these times in our lives when people have said something to us or about us that has just stuck in our hearts. Like whoever, whoever came up with that, that childhood saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a flat out liar. Words hurt. I, when I, when I first started in ministry, I, I was a junior high pastor and then um, stepped in as a young adult pastor. And uh, the church, the, the young adults group was a thriving young adults group. It was about like a, over 100 uh, young adults that were in this group. And when I stepped in uh, to lead this young adults group, the attendance just like plummeted. Um, eventually, for other reasons, Larissa and I got fired uh, from that 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 church there's just a lot of unhealth that was in the church and um anyways i got pulled into a meeting and i was told by the lead pastor i don't know if we'll ever recover from this and i just it was just a word that just 
sank to the bottom of my heart and has stayed with me. Like, I, and it just have felt like in life and in ministry, I've had the opposite of the Midas touch. That rather than everything turning to gold, a lot of times it just feels like it's just turned to garbage. <laughs> Right? There's just something, it's just been like that own place of insecurity, that own place of just like, who am I? I don't have the ability. I don't have the strength. I don't have the talent. I don't have the charisma. I don't, like that, that has just stayed with me because of that experience. Why do I say that? In Exodus chapter two, Moses, right, he lives in the palace. He lives in Pharaoh's palace. And, and one day it says he went out to see his people, the Hebrews, and as he was out there, there was, there was a fight that was taking place, and, and he killed an Egyptian person, and he buried that person. Or, sorry, there, he buries the person, and then, then two Hebrews were fighting, and, and Moses steps in to stop their fighting, and then this is what one of his fellow Hebrews tells him. Who made you leader over us? He asks, he, he tells Moses something here like, who are you? Who do you think you are? What talent, what ability, like who's, who, who's made you the guy in charge? It's no wonder that when God comes to Moses and he tells him, I'm calling you to lead the people out of the hand of the Egyptians, do you know what Moses' first statement is? Who am I? Who am I to lead? Who am I to lead to Israel? Who am I to go to Pharaoh? Friends, that word of that fellow Hebrew speaking to Moses, who are you to lead us, has stayed with Moses for years upon years. And so when God calls him, you see that insecurity immediately come to the surface. And his first question to God is, who am I? And one of God's questions back to him is, what's in your hand, Moses? What's in your hand? And, and Moses says the staff, and God tells him to throw it on the ground, and then he grabs the snake, picks it back up, it turns back into a staff, and then God says, so that they will know. Now listen to the things that God doesn't say. It doesn't say so that they will know you have all of the leadership capability. He doesn't tell Moses so that they know that you are a man of eloquent speech. It isn't so that they know that you have this charisma and this, this quality about you. No. God's statement to Moses is this. So that they will know that I have appeared to you. Friends, Moses' reputation simply is this. He is a man that knows the name of God. The I am has appeared to him. That's it. And what Moses is known for, when you look over the pages of scripture, what Moses is known for is he is known as a man that has a friendship with God. Moses, this is what will set you apart. God has made himself known to you. You have relationship with him. His presence is with you. When I first was asked to officiate a wedding, I, I, man, I was just with so much zeal. I was like looking over all of the different elements of a wedding ceremony. And, and I got to the point of the ceremony where I got to the ring exchange. And I just did this deep dive. Like what in the world is this part of the ceremony where we exchange rings from one another. Because I've been in, I've attended weddings before, and a lot of times the statement that's made is, is that this, this is a precious metal, and it's a circle, and it reminds us of, of the eternal nature of God and the eternal nature of love. And I was like, is that, 
but where, where's the history of it? Why do, we, why do we do ring exchanges? And I came to find out that one of the things that's, oh, the, where it has its origins is that when we exchange rings, it harkens back to the days of covenant. And it harkens back to the days of when the, the husband would, or the groom would give the wife a ring, but then he would also hand her a big old pouch of money. We need to bring that back, don't we, women? <laughs> and it was a way to say, all that my family has, you have. All that is mine is yours. And so when I do wedding ceremonies, when I officiate wedding ceremonies, the one thing that I want people to know, the husband and wife to know, is this, look at your hand. You're in covenant. It is a statement that you're making to one another right now that says, all that I have is yours. All of my power, all of my resources, all of my affection, everything that I have belongs to you. And what I find absolutely intriguing by, by the Lord here to Moses is that when he asks him, what's in your hand? Moses responds, he says, it's a staff. And then he takes them through this scenario where he says, throw it on the ground and, and it becomes a snake and he picks up the snake. But then it's this statement from God now that says, it is a sign to the people that I have appeared to you. So Moses, every time that you look at your hand, what you were reminded of is you're in covenant. There are going to be days that you are going to doubt yourself. There are going to be days that, that Pharaoh is going to come back with furiosity and anger. There are going to be plagues that hit this land. There are going to be days that you're literally going to be sitting in pitch black darkness. There are going to be days when flies and locusts are swarming all around you. There's going to be a day when, when the cries of, of infants and the cries of children dying around the land, there are going to be days of torture ahead. There are going to be times when you're walking around the wilderness and people are going to be grumbling. They're going to be upset with you. There are going to be days when you're just, you're just going to pick up this stick and hit a rock with it, Moses. What's in your hand? It's a sign. It's a sign. I'm in covenant. I am with you. I am present with you. Fast forward from one exodus to another exodus. Passover night. Jesus breaks bread. And in this, what he communicates to the church is this. My body broken for you. My blood spilled. Disciples, friends, what I want you to know from this day forward, we're in covenant together. This is a sign. I am with you. I find absolutely incredible and what I often point out in wedding ceremonies is this after Jesus' resurrection there's a man named Thomas and he comes up to Jesus and or Jesus appears to Thomas and, and what, what Jesus tells him is this look at my hands do you see the scars And it's now, church, that we can stop wherever we're at in any moment that we find ourselves in places of difficulty, in places of frustration, in places of doubt and insecurity, that we are reminded that we can right now, we can remember 
Jesus' hands. And it is a statement to us. A covenant sealed in his blood. A promise given by him to 